so next up, everybody should know what this is. You probably have seen a lot of steampunk. It happens all over the con. Not as much in this room, which is kind of funny, isn't it? Weird. All right. <laughs> that maybe because you guys just want to know about the reality of it, which probably is not what people have out there. And this guy will tell you some of the stuff out there is actually not too far from the truth. Am I right? Yeah, probably. Uh, you probably have seen him already or read one of his books or read a blog post or something about him. Is Richard Carrier. He's going to come up here and you have to like clap because otherwise he won't come back to Dragon Con ever again. Come on, Rich. All right. Hello. Steampunk for real. Yeah, it's funny. I've done a lot of my books and stuff are on Jesus and, and or origins of Christianity or Hitler, as we talked about Friday. Um, but my actual dissertation is ancient science and technology. Uh, so this is some of the stuff I've discovered and learned in Columbia University for my PhD in ancient history. What do I mean? Well, the, 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 hopefully the objective of this is to help um, writers and game designers be inspired, but also is to give you some historical perspective because a lot of what I'm going to show you uh, has overturned pretty much all the scholarship in technology, history of technology. In the last 20 years, it's been new. Uh, the early 20th century, everybody thought the Romans were just kind of you know, fairly basic in their tech and their economics and uh, in their science, but a lot of those beliefs have been overturned. But a lot of those beliefs still get echoed out in the internet, especially by Christian apologists who like to uh, talk about how great the Christians were at creating technology and science, not knowing that all the great stuff already existed in Rome and they forgot it all and had to reinvent it later. Um, so I'm going to show you some of what I mean by that. Now I'm going to be talking about uh, the, um, let's get the proper thing here. I'm going to be talking about uh, the Roman Empire uh, at the height uh, 31 BC to roughly 235 AD was the the true pinnacle of Roman achievement in technology economics um, we even know that their industrial output peaked so high in this for example lead processing we have ice cores that show that they were industrially producing more lead and silver uh, than would ever be produced again until about the 16th century so this was a, a extremely large effective civilization um, that spanned the entire Mediterranean and, and most of Europe and North Africa. So, um, okay, so that's what we're talking about. This is the period we're talking about. But you got to remember that the Romans did inherit a lot. They loved to borrow stuff. They borrowed everything. Uh, they, the Celts made cool stuff. The Romans said, that's cool, let's use that. Uh, the Greeks invented stuff. They said, that's cool, let's use that. So they were very uh, good at borrowing and, and, and adapting things. Now, my talk, um, the bibliography for it, all of the scholarship that covers all of the evidence and so on, is actually available in a chapter that I wrote for the anthology, The Christian Delusion, uh, edited by John Loftus. So for those who want to um, get the access to all of that, find that book, get that chapter. Uh, the chapter also debunks the Christian claim that Christianity was responsible for modern science, but uh, I won't be arguing that today, maybe a little bit, but you'll see. Today we're going to talk about technology. I'm going to start with maps because this is like one of the first and most important technologies that shows how sophisticated the Romans were. The, um, of course they'd already figured out, the Greeks before them had already figured out that the earth was a sphere and they'd even measured it. Uh, they knew the diameter of the earth to roughly 10 to 15 percent accuracy. Uh, and not only that, but they knew it was inaccurate. They knew there was an inaccuracy and that they needed more accurate measurements. They just hadn't gotten around to figuring out a way to get a more accurate measurement. But they were aware of this fact. But now this is a problem for map makers. If the surface of the Earth is curved, then your maps are going to be problematic because your maps are all flat. So how do you represent curved space on a flat map? Well, uh, they developed conical projection. Uh, and not only that, they developed a latitude and longitude system. Uh, Ptolemy is the one who invented this, a uh, Roman um, astronomer of the second century AD. The reason he invented latitude and longitude is precisely because no one had an accurate measurement of the actual diameter of the Earth, but they did have super accurate for the time measurements of angles to stars and stuff in the sky. So it was, it was much easier to map the Earth in the sizes of degrees, degrees measured against the star field, um, than actual miles. And so uh, what he wrote in his thing is, well, I'm going to do the whole thing in degrees because we got good maps for that or good accuracy for that. Someday when someone figures out what an actual one degree on the Earth accurately is, then they can plug this all in and they'll be able to develop, develop better maps. Um, so he actually developed that problem to solve a problem they were trying to deal with in, in science. 
And so Latitude and Longitude was born. Of course, they were centering uh, the middle of it on Alexandria, Egypt. The British, of course, you know, when they had their own empire, decided to move it to Greenwich, England, and that's the system we use today. But it, despite that moving of that one line, uh, the system is Roman. And they had maps based on various systems of conical projection to do that. Not only did they know to map the Earth, they were mapping the sky, right? Not just star maps, uh, which they had, um, but they were also trying to develop maps of the, s well, the planetary system, right? Trying to figure out uh, what distances the planets had, uh, how they moved, and so on. And they were building um, actual mechanical instruments to represent the motions of things in the heavens. This is a depiction of one thing that Ptolemy, again, uh, has a description of how to build, um, which is a, a basically kind of like an armillary sphere. It's a, s a system for mapping and looking at things in the sky by manipulating uh, spheres and circles and so forth uh, to look at uh, and measure and predict things. Now, they had that kind of cool stuff, uh, like the, these sorts of uh, astronomical instruments and, and devices. Now, the, they weren't just doing that. Um, they, not only could they figure out uh, the size of the Earth, they were aware of that, and that it was a sphere, um, they'd also calculated the distance to the moon, uh, fairly accurately, in fact. Uh, they knew it was at roughly 200,000 miles. Uh, they did that by a clever use of trigonometry and a stick and a string. Uh, that's really all it take, uh, takes to do. Oh, and a clock, you gotta have a clock, it's important. Um, now, the interesting thing there is they were aware that the moon was super far away, but not only that, but they were aware that its orbit was not a, a circle uh, by this time, and they were trying to, Ptolemy in particular, but others before him, were trying to develop uh, ways to figure out how to map the orbit of the moon. Um, now the moon, they knew, changed its distance over time, it changed its velocity over time, uh, so they were trying to figure out how to map this. And Ptolemy um, gets a bad rap for developing the so-called epicyclic theory, where he has epicycles upon epicycles to make things, uh, to depict planetary motions. But in fact, he was well aware, and he even says that the universe probably doesn't actually work that way. He's only developing the epicycles upon epicycles to be able to create, create combined motions in order to represent non-standard orbits, uh, eccentric orbits, and in the case of the moon, something very nearly uh, to a parabolic orbit, which is very close to what the actual moon's orbit is. Um, so he was aware of doing that, and he was also aware that it wasn't fully accurate, but it was the best he could come up with. The interesting thing is, when you look at his description, what he's actually describing is a machine for reproducing the motions, uh, basically another one of these mechanical devices that allows you to reproduce where the moon will be at any given time. And so it's much easier but to depict a parabolic motion when you have a system of combined motions of circular motions, gears, in other words. Uh, so actually, he was much more clever in what he's doing and had a particular purpose that people often aren't aware of. Now, that's uh, what he was doing, but there's more to it than that. Um, they are also doing it for the planets, uh, trying to figure out the distances and the combined motions of the planets. Uh, they were aware they had eccentric orbits, they were aware they changed velocity. Uh, Ptolemy developed an equal angles and equal times law of planetary motion. Um, this is a precursor to Kepler's law of equal areas and equal times. So they had all of this stuff going on, and the th kinds of ways Ptolemy is describing it is all about how to build a machine to represent these motions. Um, we actually have one. Uh, we recovered one. They actually have these things. This is a, basically a computer. It is an astronomical computer. Um, we found one. We, we have tons of descriptions of these computers. Uh, Archimedes is the first to have built one. Uh, Ptolemy wrote treatises on how to build them. Um, Cicero and other authors write about having them or seeing them. And, but we didn't know a whole lot about them until we actually recovered one. There was a, one that was built about 120 BC. Um, sank at sea. It was someone, Romans had looted something in uh, some town or what other and packed a ship with all the loot, including one of these computers. And that ship sank off of the island of Antikythera uh, around 88 BC, which we know the date because of the coins on board the ship. And we dug this weird thing up uh, at originally when we figured to saw it. It, it defied all expectations because we had no idea they had such sophisticated technology and they didn't know what it was. Um, but actually, it's an astronomical computer. Uh, here are pieces of it. This, of course, is encrusted with um, patina and things like that. It's all broken up, smashed up. Uh, this is in the Museum of Athens, by the way. So if you're ever in Athens, you definitely have to see the Antikythera computer. Now, you can see it has uh, machinery, dials, um, and things of this nature. Here's a better shot of some of the, the drive wheel. Um, here is, you can see part of the measuring devices, that, that part of the display system for uh, that. And you can also, if you're, you probably can't tell, but there's actual Greek writing on it. The instruction manual for using it was written on it. 
And so we looked at this thing. You can see, if you look really close, you can see how minutely clockwork-like the gearing is. It's incredibly sophisticated, detailed, tiny, super efficient gears that were accurately carved and cut for the purpose of running calculations. Um, what we did with this broken up you know, chunk uh, is we x-rayed the crap out of it and used uh, computerized axial tomography to create a 3D model of what it was. And with that information, as you can see here, we built one. Um, actually, several versions have been built based on the information. This, of course, is using modern materials. Um, here's one using the materials that would have been originally used. This probably looks pretty close to what the machine originally looked like. Um, and you'll notice it's got displays on the front and back uh, serving different purposes. What were those purposes? What does it do? These dial readouts that I showed you, um, you basically turn a crank and it calculates all of these things up to, a, up to 250 years in advance. So it was able to predict things 250 years ahead. And these are the things that the dials would show you. They would tell you the phase of the moon on that date. You could turn the crank to any date up to 250 years in the future. It would tell you the phase of the moon on that date. It would tell you the position of the moon and the sun in the zodiac on that date. It would tell you the position of the five known planets in the zodiac on that date. And it would give you lunar and solar eclipse dates. Um, those wouldn't be the dates on which eclipses definitely would occur, but they would be dates on which the eclipse could occur, as opposed to dates when eclipses are physically and astronomically impossible. So it didn't predict eclipses, but it gave you a good read on when an eclipse uh, could be expected. So it did all of that, and it reconciled four different calendar systems. So there were different calendars being used. This machine would allow you to automatically uh, calculate a date in different calendars. And it did all this with gears, uh, basically, a gears and a knob. And you can see the display here uh, reconstructed with the, uh, the little marble would turn to show the phase of the moon. Um, the dial edges are at positions in the zodiac, uh, and they, there's, there's an arm for every planet and the sun and the moon. And on the other side were the uh, four calendars reconciled in a dial system uh, with a variety of smaller dials uh, to help with different things like leap years and stuff. So pretty advanced machine. Um, this is its accuracy. It's, it was accurate to less than the width of the moon out to 25 years. So every 25 years, it could tell you the position of the planet in the sky to within one moon width. Um, that's pretty impressive for a geared computer built in 120 BC. So just to give you an idea of how advanced some of their technological abilities were. Now that's computers. Um, obviously this gives us an idea of machines in general. Um, they had an understanding of the five basic machines, um, mathematically and in principle, as to how they worked and why they worked, um, how they were able to convert uh, one force into another. Uh, they knew, understood the law of the lever. That was one of the first laws of physics they developed, mathematical law of physics of the lever. Um, they knew how, to, how the wheel affects uh, different technologies. You have the windlass, for example, and the capstan, as well as just wheels in general. Uh, they developed pulleys and compound pulleys so that you can actually convert a 10 pound force into a 100 pound pull using uh, a pulley, a compound uh, interactive pulley system. Uh, they knew this about the screws. So they had water screws uh, that could lift water. They had screw jacks. They had worm gears. They had screw presses. Um, they had all of those things. They understood the principle of the wedge, uh, pushing things up a ramp or using a wedge like an ax head. Why, do those Why is it easier to push it up a ramp rather than to push it upstairs? They understood this principle. And gearing. They understood reduction gearing and speed gearing and how to change uh, speeds of things with gears. So they had all of this uh, basic knowledge, um, which they were able to apply in a lot of different ways. The first is the first real artillery. Um, and I mean just missile weapons, uh, and obviously not gunpowder yet. Um, but they came close in terms of power. Uh, they developed what's called the harmonic torsion catapult. Um, now this is an interesting device. It looks like a crossbow, but in fact it doesn't work the way a crossbow does, which is it store, the crossbow stores the tension in the bow. Um, this device, in fact, what you have is rope or cord or sinew. Um, in one case, the Romans uh, used women's hair um, when they were under siege, and that was the only supply of, of uh, oilable uh, torsion material they could get was all the women in town cut their hair off for their torsion catapults. Um, but you basically get this oiled uh, material that can store a lot of tension, and you knot it up and twist it and twist it and twist it and twist it, and you can build tremendous amounts of power in this. And so you have the two arms in, um, in these coils, and you can store a lot of energy in it, and that's the force it would provide. Um, the significance is when you use 
this form where there's, it's harmonic because there's two arms and they have to be perfectly in tune. Usually when people hear about catapults, they think of what's called an onager. Um, that's on uh, one side where it's just the one arm that goes plunk. Um, that's actually fairly primitive. Um, and in fact, in the Middle Ages, they forgot how to build harmonic torsion catapults. And so they were, the only thing they knew how to build anymore were the onagers. Torsion catapults, the harmonic torsion catapults are much more effective and powerful and ranged in size from something that would fit in your hand like a pistol uh, all the way to the size of a house. Uh, you can see a diagram here with a little Roman soldier sitting next to one. These were gigantic devices. They could be of any size and power. Um, now the Romans, this is all invented by the Greeks. The Romans perfected it. Uh, here's a depiction of one where you can see the coils are stored inside bronze metal containers, canisters. The reason is that there's so much torsion, so much tension stored in it, that if it breaks, it would cut a man in half, uh, basically explode. Uh, so they put them inside metal canisters for the safety of the crew in case something went wrong. Um, metal frame uh, catapult was the Roman addition to the thing. They also developed the inswinger catapult system, which is instead of having like a crossbow that goes like that to pull the string up, they had an inswinger that would angle in and angle out and throw your projectile out like this. A very bizarre, innovative thing that you've probably never seen in any movie depicted. But this allowed them to use much more of the stored capacity of energy in, uh, in the torsion, uh, approaching near uh, the power of uh, early handguns or early, uh, early rifles. So uh, these are very powerful devices. And these were the first devices in history to actually show, throw little tiny football lead bullets at you know, hundreds of yards. And then they would penetrate a body and go in and disappear. And we have a record of where uh, the first barbarians that were attacked with these weapons were freaking out because they didn't know where the missiles were. They were just suddenly holes were forming in their body. And they had no idea what was going on. Um, you can imagine before the age of bullets, that would be a weird thing, right? Suddenly holes are forming in your body. What the hell is going on? Um, so anyway, that was, that's one application of the technology they had. But there's more important applications. Uh, they developed and harnessed water power uh, and automation to create really what should count as the first industrial revolution. And it was an industrial revolution in the sense that they are creating automated industries using uh, harnessing natural power. Uh, they just weren't doing it with steam. And I'm going to get to steam later. Uh, of course, the first basic one is the water mill. You just pour water on a wheel, and it turns a, a stone that grinds grain. So you just basically, this is a robot that grinds grain for you. Um, the Greeks developed this. They understood not just the uh, technology of it, but they understood the science of it. They used reduction and speed gearing, depending on what type of system they were running. They understood the difference between undershot and overshot water wheels and the forces involved. Um, and they applied them on a vast scale by the Roman period. This is the Barbacol, uh, Barbacol flower factory. Um, now, originally, scholars thought this was built in the fourth century by the army at government expense. Uh, but in fact, it's been redated and re-understood. It actually was built in 115 AD. It was built by private citizens uh, on private capital. And in fact, this is a, a massive capitalist venture. Uh, capitalist venture. These uh, you know, businessmen built this thing. Not only did they build the factory, they built the aqueduct to supply the water to power the factory, um, all for profit. Uh, and what it was, it's a 16 water mill grain factory with a single uh, aqueduct fed system. It turns all of these wheels, it turns all of these millstones. In the south of France, um, it fed tens of thousands of people. So this is the first large scale factory, uh, automated factory system for the food supply. So the Romans were doing that. Um, but not only were they doing that, they were applying water technology to automate other things. Uh, we have lots of evidence and we've recovered archeologically some examples of water powered stone saws and water powered lumber mills. Uh, so they were cutting, they actually had, they were cutting wood and cutting marble uh, with you know, basically robotic saws powered by water. Um, this is an example on the epitaph of one guy who built these things. Um, from which, and from other examples of actual excavated sites, uh, we've been able to reconstruct how these auto automated saws operated. Um, and there are we know there were different ways of doing it. Uh, they set them up in different ways. But here again, once again, we've got mechanics, we've got automation uh, through water power. So this is a form of industrialization. This was applicated not just for automating stone and lumber saws, but also for, uh, and not just for grain, for grinding grain into flour, but also for grinding ore uh, for the mining and metals industry, and for grinding sand for the glass blowing industry. 
Uh, automated metal hammering. Uh, they had auto automatic hammers for different kinds of industrial processes. Uh, they had automated water pumps, so the, these kinds of things could, um, you could have different kinds of systems that would allow um, water to be lifted. Uh, mechanical clocks and public clock towers were also water powered and fairly sophisticated at the time. And they had all of that stuff. So this was the world that you lived in, if you lived in the cities anyway. Uh, this is a map showing uh, all of the excavated sites. Now this would just be a tiny fraction of the sites there were because water mills and so forth would disappear rather quickly. Um, there were a lot of them. Uh, these kinds of water powered systems were all over the Roman Empire in various capacities. Uh, and they exploded especially during that period I was talking about, 30 BC to 200 AD-ish, somewhere around there. That's when there was this explosion of automation in the system. Um, automation wasn't just for industry, though. We have an example, of course, I don't know if many people know the Romans invented the water organ, uh, the first organ, the first piano keyboard uh, that you touch it and water pressure would send air through pipes and you could get, you know, like a, a classic medieval sounding organ. Uh, they invented that, the Greeks did, but the Romans developed one that was wind powered. Uh, it would use, it used a windmill to supply pressure to actually uh, supply um, uh, energy to, to uh, create water pressure for the organ. So there was automation everywhere. Automated statues, there were puppet theaters uh, powered by steam and weights, uh, cuckoo clocks, coin-operated vending machines, ox-powered threshers and harvesters, mule-powered bread kneading machines, so they were kneading bread uh, through automated processes using animals, mold press and assembly line production. Um, one of my favorite examples is uh, these water wheels. You, would, you could basically order them and they would be shipped in crates and they would all be, have letters and numbers on them, uh, like an IKEA set, so that you would assemble it. Um, so they were pretty smart in it. They were doing all of these kinds of sophisticated things that we never realized and knew that they were doing. Now I'm going to skip really quickly through the science, because um, I want to get to more about the technology and the history. But I just want to give you an idea. I've just done some technology. I'm going to get to some more technology in a moment. I want you to also have an idea of how sophisticated and advanced they'd gotten scientifically. A lot of this science was lost uh, in the Middle Ages. Some of it was recovered at the end of the Middle Ages, um, but not all of it. Um, they developed a full lunisolar tide theory. They knew that the position of the moon and the sun were causing the tides in combination, um, and they were crediting it to a force projected by the sun and the moon, so early gravitation theory. Uh, they had figured out that comets were not atmospheric phenomena, as Aristotle said, but were actually planets in wide orbits. Um, they'd figured out precession. Uh, this was developed right before the Romans uh, by Hipparchus. They figured out that the, not only does the Earth spin, but it wobbles in a slow motion over 25,800 years. Um, they calculated that, and they were right. Uh, so that's how accurate they were able to get some of their astrophysics and astronomy. But also in optics, um, Hero of Alexandria and Ptolemy, uh, 100 years later, Hero was working in 50 AD, somewhere around there, Ptolemy around 150. They were working on and developing laws of reflection, laws of refraction. Ptolemy invented the idea of the index of refraction. They understood that uh, light refracts differently in water, in glass, and in other uh, transparent materials. And Ptolemy was trying to develop what the indexes of refraction were for different refracting materials. And we also know Ptolemy was working on studying convex and concave lenses. So he's well aware of the magnifying capabilities of glass, for example. Um, interestingly, the, the parts of his books that talk about this were lost, and we only have like snippets of them. They also had parabolic mirrors, and they were using mirrors for reflection. They under fully understood the science uh, and the mathematics behind using mirrors to create, uh, I'm sorry, magnification. So they were using magnifying mirrors. Um, it's quite likely that they were, had gotten to the point of developing magnifying lenses as well, and we know they were using some uh, primitive lenses at the time. Um, hydrostatics. Archimedes in 200 BC, Menelaus the Roman in 100 AD advanced on his work. They had laws of mathematical laws of flotation and equilibrium, principles of density and specific gravity. Um, they were using this also to create a smarter ship hull design, uh, to create aqueduct siphons, uh, so you could actually make water roll uh, run uphill um, using some of this technology and this, this science. Uh, the Romans were masters at that. Uh, so hydrostatics, not only were they developing laws of physics and getting things right, but they were also applying it in the real world. Harmonics and acoustics. Um, I'm going to mention Ptolemy again, 150 AD, but I should also uh, do a shout out to a woman uh, 100, possibly 200 years before him, Ptolemaeus. Uh, no relation as far as we know. She's one of the few women scientists we hear anything about, and she wrote one of the most important uh, scientific treatises on harmonic science at the time. 
it was not preserved. Uh, we have two quotations from it, and that's it. Uh, but, uh, but cl clearly her work was unifying different aspects of the science and influenced others, including Ptolemy later. These are the things that they figured out. They knew that sound is a wave of compressed air or matter. They knew that pitch is a function of wavelength. Uh, and they developed laws of harmonics and resonance and were applying this to acoustic theater design. Uh, so they were getting on, on that science as well. Pneumatics uh, is another field. Um, Philo of Byzantium, 250 BC, all the way to Hero of Alexandria, 50 AD. They knew that hot air expands and cool air contracts. Um, they knew also hot air rises and cool air falls. They knew that suction is actually a product of an external force, so they were aware of the existence of air pressure. Um, and uh, they were applying this to create force pumps and air horns and various other things as well. Mathematics, they not only obviously had geometry, everybody knows uh, they invented geometry, but um, they also developed conics, which is a more advanced form of geometry that works with, uh, interestingly, not just uh, cones, but in fact, describing and defining uh, parabolas uh, as part of conics. Trigonometry, plane and spherical trigonometry, a lot of people think that they didn't have that. No, they actually invented it, everybody forgot about it, and it had to be reinvented later. The trigonometry you use now is based on an Arabic Indian system because uh, everybody forgot about the Roman system before that. Uh, combinatorics, for those math geeks out there, yes, they had combinatorics and were actually working on that and developing quite impressive results. They also had algebra, a lot of people don't think they had that. Once again, their algebra was lost. It had to be completely reinvented. The algebra we use today is not Roman algebra because everybody forgot about it. Um, we recovered it and know that they had their own system of algebra back then as well. Um, okay, so that's science. Let's get back to tech. Applying science, the key thing in science is instruments. Uh, they had fairly sophisticated surveying instruments. This is a diagram showing what's called the diopter, which is a fairly sophisticated standard um, instrument with gears, screws, uh, different kinds of sights, um, wheels, and so on. Uh, this is the, like a classic steampunk looking device, uh, but it served all the practical purposes that uh, engineers needed. Um, and it used in combination with various different machines and measuring devices. And they had odometers, um, geared based systems that you roll a wagon along a road and it tells you how far the wagon has rolled um, based on gearing and so on. Uh, they also had ship's odometers that were doing the same thing for uh, water travel. They had levels of different sophistication. Um, they had uh, different kinds of sighting instruments like the groma and so on. So they were using all kinds of scientific instruments um, and they were a little bit steampunky, but the, here's, a, here's a steampunky thing. Um, not only did they have compound pulleys, but they, had, they were man-powered, so men would run in a little hamster wheel to supply the power. Uh, but they also had swivel and boom systems, so they could actually rotate and then move with the boom, and they had full compound pulley systems. Um, probably, basically, the most sophisticated kind of crane that you could have had at the time with the technology available. And th this was a standard piece of construction equipment and also port equipment. You would see these in ports all of the time as well. Well, here's a selection of medical instruments uh, made of bronze. You can see we, this is recovered from Pompeii. Uh, an entire doctor's office was buried in ash there, so we were able to get all of their instruments out of there in really good condition. Uh, complete set uh, shown here. But um, some of the stuff is incredibly advanced in the way it's designed. The, the craftsmanship is amazing. This I'm showing you here is a cataract syringe. It's basically a needle inside of another needle you can inject it in, you just stab the eye with it. You could pull the inner needle out, and what you have is a needle now with a hole at the end, and then you could like suck the cataract out, or you could inject fluids or whatever it was it needed to do. You just think about how incredibly difficult it is to manufacture a thing like this, and that it, this was standard equipment with, for doctors at the time. If they can do this, they can do all kinds of other things. Um, oh, this is the part where I scare everyone. This is a vaginal speculum. Uh, with, made out of bronze with you know screw gears and the whole deal. It's a bit scary. Um, but for those of you who don't have a vagina, um, this, is, this is a catheter, a male catheter for the penis made of bronze. Um, which is impressive that they had catheters, but just imagine a bronze catheter being shoved up there. So, but you know, to get everybody, you know, uh, they also had rectal speculums. That's the one, the big fancy one on the other side there. Yes, that goes in your ass to spread your ass open. Um, yeah. So um, anyway, now that I freaked everybody out, let's move back to other topics. <laughs> 
Well, not only could they make really sophisticated, refinely made instruments for doctors, but they were doing this in all areas of life. Uh, this here is at the Getty Museum. Uh, it's a folding portable bronze cauldron tripod. Folding metal furniture was common. Uh, they had lots of different types of it. Folding chairs, folding tables. Um, this is a fairly sophisticated folding cauldron tripod. It's just impressive that they're doing this and were aware of the need of it and could build it. And the craftsmanship, level of craftsmanship was up to the task. And it also had fancy design. Like they had this the good aesthetic for their machines and instruments as well, um, which also I think fits the steampunk aesthetic. But let's talk about pumps because that's gonna get us to steam. Um, here we have a continuous flow firefighting pump, meaning uh, two people would pump this in joint action, so you'd have a continuous stream of water coming out of it. It has a directional nozzle, so the nozzle increases the, the water pressure, and you could turn it and raise it, so you could actually shoot at different uh, pieces of fire when you're fi you know, fighting a fire. Now, the, the thing I'm showing, uh, the one that's red there, that's a modern instrument. It's still being used in the 19th century, still in some places used today. It's the same machine. Uh, this was invented by the Romans and just passed on. Um, the item above it that looks a little trashed, that's an actual recovered piece of one of these Roman uh, instruments. And you can see how sophisticated and intricate uh, the design is. And that's important because we have a lot of examples of their uh, pump and valve technology. They had stopcocks, they had valves, um, they had different kinds of pipe fittings. And one thing we know, this is an example of some of the, the elegant design they had. They were using precision die casting to produce these pipes. So you would make a mold out of wax and use a lost wax method to create the pipes. And this allowed them, and we have recovered examples confirming this, to have pipe fittings uh, that were tight to as much as one-tenth of a millimeter. Um, any engineers out there think about that. Um, some of the pumps we have we have their clearances were between 0.1 and 0.35 millimeters throughout the system. Uh, the efficiency in transfer is about 95%. So they had incredibly sophisticated advanced machinery in terms of pumps and pipe fittings. Um, here's an example of a cylinder block and camshaft pump. Uh, now this is a straight two. They had straight sixes and straight eights. Um, but this one, we actually, that's a recovered example, a photograph uh, from Rome, ancient Roman times, um, and then a diagram of how it worked. And this is again as a continuous flow uh, uh, crank system um, that allows you to pump water continuously and fairly sophisticated. Uh, so they had cylinder blocks. They had the concept of the cylinder block. They had the concept of the camshaft. So all of that, they had all of that stuff. Why did they not have a scientific revolution? Why did they not have an industrial revolution? So uh, the question comes down to what do you mean, first of all? Uh, in a sense, they did have an industrial revolution. They just hadn't figured out uh, coal yet. I'm going to get to that in a moment. Um, but let's talk about scientific revolution. What is a scientific revolution? What defined the 16th century, 17th century as the period of the scientific revolution? Um, and I used to think it was that they started throwing out all the bad methods and stuck with the good methods. And they had all the good methods in antiquity too, but were mixing them up with bad methods. Until you start looking at what was being written about nature in the exact time of the scientific revolution, and there's a lot of crap uh, as well. People tend to focus on the successes and don't look at all the crappy, stupid stuff that people were doing at the same time. So they were still, our scientists were still using bad methods alongside good. But what did define it uh, were these things in particular in spreading them and applying them widely. Use of measuring and instruments, key. Uh, repeatable experiments, key. And mathematical laws and descriptions, also key. Now, all of those things were being done in antiquity. So all, they had all of that. They were already doing it. I showed you some of the successes they'd had applying all of these things. Now, we also tend to associate the scientific revolution with the greatest achievement of it, the culmination of it, which is the realization that we could explain the motion of the planets with heliocentrism and universal gravitation theory, that you can, you can predict the motions with a law of physics explaining why the planets are moving and why they're moving at the rates they are and the, the shapes they are. Um, that's part of it. The parabolic heliocentric model using laws of motion and gravity, that kind of was the capstone of the scientific revolution. Once we'd achieved that, we realized, holy crap, we can do amazing things, and then that uh, took off from there. And that, that, of course, benefited from telescopes and microscopes. Now, the significance of that is that telescopes and microscopes, we know, as I mentioned, experiments were already underway with magnifying mirrors and concave and convex lenses, so they were already working with that kind of stuff, so they were really close. 
um, the parabolic heliocentric model was already being debated at the time. Heliocentrism and parabolic orbits were things that astronomers were arguing with each other about. They were aware that heliocentrism worked as an explanatory model. They just weren't sure of the physics of it. So there were still competing uh, ways of explaining the solar system. And they developed such sophisticated geocentric models. That computer I showed you before is based on geocentric model, and it's accurate to 250 years uh, to one zodiac width of planetary position. You can see why they weren't really impressed by heliocentrism when they could make geocentrism work so well. Um, and then we have laws of motion and gravity. A lot of people get stuck on Aristotle, but Aristotle was just the beginning. There were actually several treatises on laws of motion and gravitation written by other authors, Strato, Hipparchus, Ptolemy. Um, all of them are gone, and we actually know very little about what was in them. Uh, and But we do know that they were engaging in actual physical experiments to try and rework laws of motion and gravity. So they were really close. Why didn't they get there? I think the reason is, is that uh, they ran out of, well, to use the joke, they ran out of steam right before uh, they did it. Um, what happened is uh, they, were, they were cooking with gas. They were doing really well uh, with scientific research and they were getting to the point where I think they were just close to a scientific revolution. But then they got stuck in a civil war. Uh, civil war started 235, it lasted 50 years. Um, so the war, it was torn apart by civil war for 50 years, the whole Roman Empire. Right at the end of the 50 years, their fiduciary economy collapsed. So they had the Great Depression, their version of it. Now imagine if our civil war lasted 50 years instead of five, and the Great Depression happened right at the end of it. Um, you can imagine that that is a death blow to any civilization. Um, so their response to it was extreme forms of fascism, extreme forms of religious escapism, um, the beginnings of the Middle Ages and the, me and the medieval mindset. And this was all done by pagans. The pagans were already going towards fascism or already going towards uh, mysticism and so on to try and uh, get away from this. They'd also killed off a lot of their engineers and scientists during the wars, so they actually, the sophistication of craftsmanship dropped as well. You can see this in the craftsmanship of statues before the wars and after. Uh, they never recovered the ability to make uh, instruments and equipment the same as they could before. Then the Christians took over and kept all of that in place and didn't fix anything. So that's basically why we got stuck with uh, a non-scientific culture for a thousand years before uh, people started to think, you know what, that science thing that those pagans had was kind of cool, why don't we do that again? So that's, that's basically what happened there. But what about the Industrial Revolution? I mean, they were already having one, and they had everything in place for a steam-based revolution. They had wind and compressed air power um, that they were using. They, had, they could actually move and uh, automate robots and various devices using wind power and compressed air uh, based on uh, heat, heat sources. They had steam power. They understood how to cultivate steam to produce rotary motion. The, they developed a steam turbine and to lift. Uh, they were developed a device that could lift a ball with steam to show that there was actual lifting force possible with steam. Now these were demonstration devices. They were scientific laboratory devices for, for demonstration uh, of principles. They weren't used for uh, industry. And you might wonder why not? Like they have it, they have uh, everything else. Uh, here's what they had. I mean, they had steam and air propulsion. They had steam turbines. They had uh, air, air powered doors. They had principles of gas expansion and contraction. They understood the science of it. They had applied laws of mechanics and gearing. They had industrial automation, as we saw extensively. They had cylinder block pumps and camshafts. They were way ahead of the game. Uh, they even had precision die-cast pipe fittings, which is crucial for a successful steam revolution. Everything. They had everything. So why didn't they have a steam revolution? And I think the answer to that is coal. Um, the, the reality is steam power is actually kind of shitty. It sucks, unless you have a really good power uh, source of fuel. Um, the fact of the matter is, if you're going to power a steam engine with wood or just have a dude turn the crank, the dude costs a lot less in fuel. The amount of food you feed the guy to turn the crank is way less than the amount of wood you're going to be burning uh, to get that machine to work. And they were aware of this. They weren't stupid. They actually looked at this stuff. They figured out, well, this is how much uh, fuel you have to burn to make steam power anything. Animals are way cheaper, so let's just stick with the animals. Uh, or water power, or human power. <laughs> But what if you have a fuel like coal, where you can have a vast amount of energy stored in a small amount of space, um, and you can get it plentifully and cheaply? Well, they just started, the Romans just started mining coal in about the first or second century AD in England. Uh, and the only reason they were doing it is because coal was just sticking out of the ground. You just walk up and pull off a chunk, and you could, you could use it to heat your baths or heat your houses or whatever. Um, so they just started, and in fact, what happened was all throughout the Middle Ages, they kept mining the coal, they kept mining the coal, they were using it all the time. They weren't using it for automation um, because, well, as I just showed, the civilization collapsed and they forgot about how to do stuff. But 
um, the innovation went away. But what I think happened uh, is quite simply this. Um, science in ancient Rome was mostly based around Alexandria, Egypt. That was the main center of science. There were some in the south of France and other areas, but uh, that was the main thing. There's not a lot of coal in Egypt. Um, it's certainly not surface coal. So it was, seems silly to even suggest that steam power could do anything. Why, why do that when animals, humans, and water are way more effective? But in England, uh, they kept mining the coal until they'd mined the coal all the way down below the water line. So now they need more coal, they gotta pump the water out to get to the coal. And it took a thousand years to mine that much coal until their mines were so deep that they had to actually start pumping water out to get to more, more of the coal. And it was only then, this is around uh, the late, uh, late 17th century, it was only then that one guy said, you know what, I can power a pump with steam, we can th throw coal in it, and you know what, it'll cost nothing because we'll actually gain more coal than we burn to get to the coal, right? So the steam engine that he developed was basically zero cost to them. Uh, this had never happened before. This was not the case in ancient Rome. There was no instance uh, where coal would be zero cost. Coal is gonna, always gonna cost more than other sources of fuel. But in this one particular instance when um, Savory developed uh, his very simple steam engine, superly in inefficient, I mean, it's a terrible steam pump, uh, but it does the job. It gets water out and allows you to mine more coal and you can keep feeding the coal into the machine as a sort of tax on your, your pump. Um, and then once they started realizing that, they started, once they had that, other people started refining it. Let's make this steam engine more effective because more effective means more money, right? Because we can get more coal that we're not burning in the engine. We can sell that coal. So they started refining the engines more and more and then started to realize the efficiency of the engine is better than animals and humans. And then you get the industrial revolution. <laughs> But no one thought of this until Savory tried to solve one particular problem uh, with one particular instrument that made sense on that one particular case. Um, no, no such situation existed in ancient Rome. So it never occurred to anyone that you could make an, if, an engine so efficient that steam would actually be more efficient than animals and humans or water power. Um, and I think that's the reason the Industrial Revolution in the sense of steam power didn't occur in Rome, which means all of those who, of you who want to write counterfactual histories have given you lots of ideas about how to get steam power in ancient Rome, uh, what discoveries were needed, what insights were needed, even if it's not a discovery. What, what did a scientist have to think uh, to come up with uh, the thing and change history? Uh, imagine if we had the steam revolution and the scientific revolution a thousand years earlier. Uh, where we would be today. Uh, it's quite impressive to think about it. Um, I'm actually going to use the rest of my time to take some questions from the audience, but I want to uh, do a little bit of um, self-promotion. Uh, I'm an independent scholar. This is what I do. Uh, I'm like a starving artist. I just live off of what I can sell uh, in books and other things. Um, I have books of various kinds on various subjects in print, audio, and Kindle. Uh, the audio books are read by me, uh, for those who are interested. I also teach online courses once a month, uh, and this is an important source of income for me. It's uh, 69 bucks for a one-month online course in various subjects in philosophy, history. Soon I'm going to do ancient science and technology uh, for lay people. Uh, all that info you can get at richardcarrier.info. Um, so that's enough about me. Oh, I'll also mention that I have some copies of Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, um, which is a collection of my historical papers and various subjects, a lot of it exciting and interesting. I'll be selling the last of the stock of those that I have, uh, maybe 10, 15 copies, I'm not sure what I've got left, right after this at the skeptical, um, Skeptrack table, uh, where that is it's out in the hall there. First one on the left. First one on the left, yeah. Um, yeah, so, yes, right. Uh, left of the escalators, you said? Yeah, if you go all the way out past the elevators, then there's escalators. Yes. Right to the left of the escalators is the first table. Yeah, just keep going that way. Uh, to the left of the escalators, uh, past the elevators here. Um, yeah, so I'll sell the rest of those if, if those of you are interested. Um, but let's take questions for 15 minutes. Uh, anything on ancient science and technology? Yes. Um, I don't know whether I can well, frame this exactly as a question. It may be a statement I just mm -hmm. want you to react to. Um, there's a sense that I have about uh, the ancient world and the modern world that there's something missing by the time a steam engine comes along, or there's something that was missing that we have by the time a steam engine mm -hmm. comes along, which is a, a method of economic calculation. You, you, are, right. you are better equipped with Roman numerals and a double entry bookkeeping system to figure out how much something costs and whether yeah. widespread coordination across an economy is 
uh, profitable or not, whether anybody's yeah. going to buy it. Any any sense of that? Any reaction to that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, actually, this is something that I've studied. Um, they had double entry bookkeeping systems, uh, and they actually had mathematical systems that were more sophisticated than just using Roman numerals. In fact, Greek systems were pretty effective. Um, they also had a decimal place system notation. They had a, they had a, their abacus, uh, which is a simple abacus, used decimal uh, notation uh, or decimal calculation. Um, no, and so that not only do we know that they had the math, um, they also had uh, their algebra they were using for logistics. So they were up to the point of using algebra for economic logistics. Uh, a lot of what the examples in, in the textbook that we've recovered from them has is that kind of thing, is calculating those sorts of things. But, um, but we also see the results. Uh, so they're clearly capable of doing some pretty amazing things. I mean, I talked about all of the technologies and industrialization. But to give an example, oh, an example is the, the, the boxes, the crates of water wheels that you could get at, with the IKEA assembly system. They were aware of that. They were aware of making chandeliers where different parts would be made in different factories and assembled together in another position. So they were able to coordinate economic production in that fashion. Um, but one of the most impressive examples of their abilities is uh, there is a fort recovered um, near Hadrian's Wall up in England, and they just built it, and, or they were just about to finish building it, and the barbarians were going to take over, so they just buried it. They just buried the fort so that the enemy couldn't get the stuff, and they ran away. We excavated it, and what we found was a warehouse on that fort that had a million nails. Now, I want you to th think about that for a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hadrian's Wall, the furthest reaches of the Roman Empire, they had a million nails, clearly as just a standard starter kit for your, for your you know, frontier fort. Um, so not only did they, were they capable of producing a million nails, and way more than that, because this is just one, right? This is one, one fortress. Not only could they produce those nails, they shipped them there um, and didn't think twice about it. Like, this is just standard. Let's send them a million nails. Obviously, they're going to need them. Uh, forensics were done on those nails, and they found that there's six different types, and they're all made in a particular way in six different ways, specifically for specific functions. So they had, they were able to diversify ty nail type uh, for different functions. Um, this requires impressive coordination uh, economically, um, certainly. And one of the things the Romans were most famous for is logistics in their military. It was one of the reasons they could kick so much ass. It wasn't just that they were badass on the battlefield, which they were, uh, but they were always had their supply lines well done and well planned. Um, good and building so, forts. Yeah, <laughs> building forts, building roads for the purpose, too, and making sure that wherever the army's going to be, they're going to have food, water, all the things, that it, nails, <laughs> more nails for all the stuff they have to do. So yeah, I, they had all of that stuff. It was just all forgotten, uh, lost in the Middle Ages. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask something about the uh, outswinger crossbows. And in the, swinger, the, yeah, the one yeah, that goes like swinger. that. Yeah. Uh, from what I understood, um, we didn't know we don't know exactly how they were made or put together, and nobody has been able to reproduce working ones with materials that they would have had at the time. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if anyone has yet. Um, the the author to start with on this, and I just want to plug her because her book is freaking fantastic. Um, it's called just called Catapult, and it's by Tracy Reel. Um, she's one of the greatest historians of ancient science uh, living today, uh, and she wrote the definitive, it's a massive book by the way, but it's an entertaining read because she does social history and stuff in it too. But it's the entire history of the catapult up to the, the everything we know about the inswinger catapults and how we know it and all of that, and where we are at reconstruction. Um, so that's the place to start and if you're interested in looking at it. I just want to recommend her book in general. Um, it's fantastic. It'll be the required reading in the field for 50 years at least. But. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone's actually been able to successfully build one. One thing is, is that they're kind of dangerous to make. Um, so oftentimes the experimental devices use modern materials that we're more familiar with. Um, so that's that's one limitation. But I don't even know if anyone's built one out of modern materials yet. I'm not sure. So There's a group of hobbyists who try to recreate yeah. Roman hand crossbows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the fact that they're you know, dangerous to make, doesn't that sort of imply that that kind of technology wasn't very widespread or wasn't? Oh, no, it's because um, you got to realize uh, they had mastered it. So we, we have a learning curve, right? So it's dangerous from some, for some noob to go and try and make, uh, you know, one of these devices. But these guys have been making them for hundreds of years. They had it down to an art, right? So, um, so yeah, I'm sure there were some labs and experiments in the field, and the early catapults were exploding. That's why they started designing them, so there were sad safety features. <laughs> but... Uh, but no, yeah, no, they, they were so much ahead of the curve of us in terms of how to build them. They had all that, all that institutional craftsmanship knowledge is lost, and the only way to get it back is to is it risky ways or expensive ways, and so that's limiting to us. Hey, 
So the central idea of a steam engine, so you're talking about uh, mm -hmm. the steam revolution being limited by fuel. Yeah. Um, the central idea of a steam engine is the rapid depressurization of water vapor. Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of like thermodynamic knowledge. Now you mentioned some pneumatics with fluids. Yeah. Was there any evidence that they knew about this thing specifically or most thermodynamics? Yeah, they knew it at least as well as Savory did which is key. Um, and in fact, they were using the principle uh, with water displacement and, and pressure release uh, for automated doors. Uh, these doors weren't used in normal life. They were used for uh, puppet theaters. But um, they understood the principles. They were well aware of ways to do this. Yeah. They were, way, they were aware of the way to increase pressure and decrease pressure to make objects move and to make, them, uh, make the cycle go over and over again. But that's not um, exactly the... No, but it's what you need to know, right? Mm -hmm. It's all Savory needed to know. And in fact, probably Savory was just relying on like the, work, the writings of Hero and other... Because uh, Hero has a whole book called Pneumatics that survived, um, eventually survived. It was forgotten for a long time. Um, that has a ton of different ways to manipulate air and water pressure. Mm -hmm. um, and so what Savory did is basically just an application of that using a different power source. Um, so so I, I think they had what they needed to know in that regard. Okay. Uh, and then, of course... Once you have a working machine that's actually profitable, then you start making refinements and you get watts, and then you start getting like much more advanced ways of regulating steam pressure and so on. So uh, I think that stuff mostly came later uh, once people were realizing that we can make badass steam engines. So you first you have to have the idea that it's even worth bothering. Uh, so that, that's, the, that's the one key thing that has to happen before anything else happens. How are you doing? Um, what did the Romans do in terms of, okay, somebody says, all right, I'm going to build you an aqueduct, and I'm going to take stone out of it and make it stronger. That would be a tough sell. But they obviously had a process by which they could, uh, you know, say, okay, I got this great idea, let's implement it, and then it's going to be recognized, and we're going to send it all around the empire. Uh-huh. It, did they did they just say okay build the thing and then we'll see if it collapses? <laughs> um, well, we don't have enough stories to answer that question okay. as to what the the process was. Um, for example, I mean they had we were masters of concrete. Uh, yeah. In fact, the Romans developed hydraulic concrete, which is concrete that dries underwater. Mm -hmm. um, that's badass. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. So. Um, uh, so they're, they're very good at figuring that out, and they're able to do lots of things with it. Um, and there have been historians who've asked that question, uh, especially for architecture. When you're building these massive temples using domes and things like that, um, somebody, there has to have been like early phases of where these things were failing, right? There has to have been mistakes, uh, and, and I'm sure there were. And so we, we just don't have records of those. Uh, so it's possible they were, they were done at certain scale until something failed, and then someone, engineer, is sent in to figure out why it failed, and that's a new advance is made, and then that gets spread around. Um, we also know the knowledge is being disseminated very efficiently. Um, the cylinder block pumps that I mentioned is an example where uh, they were made out of, the actual cylinder block was cut from wood. Uh, and in fact, it's been pointed out that this is actually a much more effective way to make pumps in modern Africa in some villages and stuff. Rather than trying to get expensive metal pumps in there, they can make pumps out of local materials using the Roman method. Um, that's a side note. But the interesting thing is the design of these pumps is weirdly consistent all across the Roman Empire from the farthest reaches, uh, which suggests that they had manuals for building them that they were disseminating. So they figured, oh, this is how this thing works. This is the best way to do it. Let's get these manuals out there. Um, or they had engineers trained in schools that had common curricula. Uh, either way, one way or the other. So the knowledge would spread um, once some new innovation came out. And we have some evidence of that in terms of how innovation spread in architecture, for example. So. Thank you. Uh, wh what's your sense of the uh, evaluation of probability uh, that that uh, the ancient world had, like the ability to analyze a uh, dice game? Oh or, yeah, uh, that's combinatorics risk. is yeah. part of that. Um, yeah, probability theory. We wish we knew more. Um, there's some very tantalizing stuff in Cicero, uh, where Cicero himself is not a mathematician, but he's well educated, so he's talking about math. Uh, and he's aware of the use of combinatorics in probability theory. Um, so someone was writing about it, and we just don't have any of those books. 
uh, and that's that's one of the annoying things. Um, also, more primitive ideas of just probabilistic epistemology uh, were being developed by the Epicureans, at least, because we have snippets of their books talking about probability as the basis of knowledge from uh, Herculaneum, uh, the Library of Herculaneum. That was when Pompeii was buried in ash, so was Herculaneum. There's actually a library in Herculaneum completely intact. It, the, all the scrolls are charred, but they're still buried. It's still sitting there waiting to be excavated. And we've excavated some of the scrolls, but there's still a whole bunch there for lack of funds to get in there and do it. Um, so there's a library to find in there. But uh, we found pieces of this. So we know they were working with probability theory, and we know they were applying combinatorics and permutation theory. Um, we, just, we just have like hints of the results. So we don't know what was being written and so forth. Um, so it was going on. Uh, we just don't know exactly the details of it. Uh, but Cicero is one to talk about. I think, what is it? Uh, creationism. There's a book about creationism by Sedley. Uh, there's a book about ancient creationism by S the, the scholar's name is Sedley. And uh, it's a fascinating book, but it, it's the one that covers discussion of probability theory in the arguments between the atheists and the creationists back then, uh, where they're talking about uh, what is the probability of these amazing biological structures arising. Uh, and the Epicureans said, well, if you have uh, infinite planets, then the probability is one. Because, uh, right? Uh, and then Cicero points out that, well, no, because the combinatorics and so forth, it, even if you had, right, he doesn't think there's infinite, but if you, there's a certain amount, it's so, he's doing combinatoric mathematics to show that, you know, the probability is so low that, uh, like, that's not even a reasonable thing to think. Um, so he's applying math that existed at the time. We just don't have those books, and I just wish we did, but, yeah. And, and what is probably the geekiest question I'm going to ask for years. Um, <laughs> this is so, I, let's see if I frame this correctly. I've always wondered at this. Why, if you have Pythagoras and you have numbers, why do you have to wait till Descartes to get coordinate geometry, like analytic geometry? Oh, that's a good well, question. Why, why were those two ideas not combined? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I mean, one key thing is that, that almost everything the Greeks were doing, they are using geometry for. Um, so even their... Even their um, I mean, like their conics, uh, their their early calculus version of calculus, their trigonometry, it's all fundamentally geometric. Um, so I think they were so happy using their standard method of geometry that, that it was working fine for them. And I don't think they, were, they had <laughs> so, like, figured out they any applications. They didn't need more accuracy in their uh, well, they, they needed someone, system. They needed, they needed someone need to it. need that, right? Yeah. So if you're going to do coordinate ge geometry, you, you need it for something. And once they figured that out, like they needed something, like Archimedes needed some place notation number systems for large numbers. He needed a logarithmic system. So he invented both of those things just because he needed them to do a thing that he wanted to do. Um, so the key, the key way to answer that question is, what is the need? What would be the need that would drive someone to develop that? They certainly could have developed it. They just, there had to be a need for it that would inspire someone to do it. Um, so as thinking in terms of counterfactual history, that's the thing you look for is like, what, why was Descartes doing that? then? What, what kind of problem was he trying to solve? And is that a problem that could plausibly have arisen in the ancient world? And that, that's a more complicated question. Yeah. Hi. Uh, the system of patronage was very big in the Roman world. I mm -hmm. wonder if you could speak at all to how it may have helped or hindered the advancement of technology, turning what would have been normally a, a scientific curiosity into an industrial product. Yeah, um, of course, we already see that they're doing industry really well, uh, so there wasn't any barrier there. Um, there was, patronage was very important. Um, it was actually, if anything, that was an, a boon to scientific advances because that was the best way to get a scientist employed doing stuff. The downside is, is that the scientist is mostly going to be employed doing stuff that his employers want him to do. Uh, so that's why they were really good at things that were, had practical applications like astronomy, uh, medicine, um, uh, basic mechanics and engineering, but weirder things, uh, you know, like counting finches and stuff. Um, uh, no one was interested in that, so patrons were generally not supporting it. There was some support for botany, zoology, and things like that, uh, but generally you had to show that there was a point to it, like some application, like medicine or something, um, or physiology for medical uses. Um, so patronage would create that limitation, is that the, what the patrons want would more drive what science gets done. Uh, but nonetheless, it, had there been no patrons, there probably would have been no science, because it's usually middle class guys who are raised by craftsmen who are were, or were craftsmen and then also get to go to school to become as literate as the elite. Uh, people who are, who are bridging those two gra the gaps, the, the aristocracy and the working class, they were in the middle there. 
those are the people who had the skill sets necessary to be good scientists. And, and we know this from looking at the biographies of the scientists. They're all these people. They come from the craftsman class but have elite educations. You combine those two things and you get you know, Heron of Alexandria, you get Archimedes, and so on. Um, so that, that's key, uh, a key factor, and, and patronage was a thing that, that drove that. And in the scientific revolution, it wasn't all that different. I mean, really, you had governments as patrons sometimes, uh, but you had that in ancient Rome sometimes, too. Uh, it's just blurry, blurry, blurry lines between emperor and patron, right? Uh, so um, I don't think there's as much difference between the scientific revolution and, and the Roman Empire on that score uh, as people often think. Okay, last question, because you've only got a few seconds left. Go for it. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming. I really enjoyed Thanks. your panel. It was fantastic. Uh, I did want to ask about the, the chart that you were showing, showing the fiduciary crisis that happened in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it, I, and I may be misreading the conclusion you were drawing on it, but do you think that the, the rise of Christianity wasn't necessarily a uh, cause of the lack of research into science, but more of a reaction to the... Um, the dismal straits that the empire found mm -hmm. itself in. I mean, because there was lots of people that were convinced they had yeah. lost the morality of their ancestors. Yeah, I think um, by and large, no, it's definitely an effect of the pagans screwed everything up in the third century, and Christianity is their penalty for it. Um, it, it wasn't. It wasn't that the Christians caused anything. The, what the Christians did was not fix it. Right, so the, the pagans broke it, and then the Christians took over and said, we like this broken thing, let's run with it and make it even more broken, um, rather than turn things back and, into what they had been before. Um, so like the systems of fascism, the, the death penalty for everything, that was like the thing that happened in the third century is let's kill everybody for anything, to, that'll, that'll make people fall in line. Um, we know this doesn't work, but that's what they did, and the Christians you know, continued that. Um, restricting freedoms, the pagans were already starting to do that, the Christians just did it more. Uh, so all of these things, that's, that's what happened. Um, so the Christians, Christianity is, a, is an effect of the fall of the Roman Empire, not, not a cause of it. Um, it's just it didn't fix it, and that, that's the one thing you can criticize the early Christianity for. Uh, just one more thing I was going to ask. Do you think that that was a deliberate effort or more something that was just kind of um, inherent to the nature of the belief? Um, well, you know what? That chapter I mentioned in uh, The Christian Delusion answers that question. It's all about that. So I'll leave you at that. So thank you so much.